Welcome back to Hermit Radio. I'm here with my friend Brad Schmidt, and we're going to be talking about his story today. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to let him introduce his piece and speak <laughs> about his story. It's definitely not a short story, but for the sake of our window, I asked him to condense it down a little bit. Um, it's a great story, and it kind of goes along with my story, what we've been talking about as far as change and how people can bounce back and change their life around, and it all comes down to choosing and being who you want to be. Brad, go ahead. Yeah, wow. Uh, choosing and being who you want to be. Yeah, I didn't even really think or knew that I had a choice with that at all until uh, the last 10 years or so. Um, anyway, thank you, Cameron, and I've enjoyed the uh, the bits and pieces of your past podcast. I mean, I just really love the idea of being spiritually connected and um, being open to change, sort of connect with spirit without getting too woohoo about it. No, I mean... I love that because that's exactly what it was for me. Um, I, I, my listeners have already heard this, and I kind of touched on it with you, but I was in a real bad place with myself mentally, and it took realizing who I was becoming and really hitting rock bottom before I snapped up and I was like, whoa, I'm not this person. I'm just pretending to be this person, and I want to change. Nice. Well, I want to hear that, but I'll, I'll go first. I'll show you mine first. <laughs> yeah. And you show me yours. Um, so, yeah. So, um, I'm going to try to do a three to four minute version of my story here. Uh, I grew up, my dad died when I was a boy of cancer. And uh, that left my mom with four kids. And she, um, she was a rager. Um, she yelled and threw things and was often um, physically and verbally abusive to us. And uh, I often would hear, my mother would often tell me, you're a fat, lazy, selfish, stupid piece of shit. And so that was the uh, message that I would get. That's the message I heard for sure. There, there likely were loving instances with her and other family members. Um, I got caught up in feeling less than. Um, those are the messages that I heard, and those are the messages that were sort of tattooed on my sort of psyche. That's, that's, that was my operating condition. So my first um, uh, self-medications were attention and food. And um, look at me, look at me, look at me. I was the jokester in class. Uh, not a whole lot at home, because my mother would tell me to shut the F up. Um, but, you know, I would seek that attention outside the home the validation outside as much as I could, and yeah, so I was the jokester. I was uh, over eight, um, and eventually that led to alcohol and drugs. Uh, and the attention and the food are still with me today, um, one thing at a time. So uh, yeah, that turned to alcohol and drugs, and um, and just a, a selfish and fearful way of living. And so, you know, I became a, a media guy, a, a radio personality, and a, and a newspaper columnist because, uh, I mean, I did like writing, but I mostly wanted the attention. I couldn't be like a rock star or a superstar quarterback, so my path to fame was going to be media, and that was all just me seeking validation. Um, and that all came crashing down, and, and I had success with that by by media or outside world standards, you Big know. Time. I had a column that was pretty well read, a celebrity news column called Brad About You. My name was in it. Man, feed that validation, baby. You know, just, I mean, I had a golf tournament called The Brad. I don't know who came up with that creative name, but, you know, I would complain about it, but inside I was like, yes, yes. And, you know, I got this radio job, which is how I met your wife. Um, um, she was uh, into pop music, I guess, at the time, and came to some of our events and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so it looked like I was succeeding, but wildly, really. Um, you know, I was on a pop radio station, and um, gosh, you know, celebrities knew my name, and young girls would give a shout out to the club, and and it was just, you know, gosh, I mean, it was, I was living like the bachelor dream life of sorts, um, and it came. And, and even in the middle of that, I would wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, no. 
like just sure that it was gonna all come crashing down, that they were gonna figure me out, that they were gonna know that I was a fat, lazy, selfish, piece, stupid piece of shit um, that I knew to be. And um, um, that came crashing down on February 19th, uh, 2010. I got my second DUI in three years when I was a reporter for the ABC affiliate in Nashville, and they fired me. And, uh, you know, the Tennessean wrote about it, and the other local medias reported, and I felt so full of shame, and there was even a little suicidal ideation during those few days after. And, um, and the judge threw me in jail for a few days and then sent me to rehab. And that saved my life. And when I say that, I don't know, because I was using a fair amount of cocaine and drinking almost every day. I don't know that I would have killed myself, but getting drunk and killed, um, I certainly mean that in a spiritual way, that it saved my life. Because I was living, I was just living a life full of fear. So I found through rehab, I found 12-step recovery. I found um, a God is my understanding. It's often said in 12-step rooms. I found a connection to spirits. I found um, uh, work at the YMCA, and through that I found some Christian-based groups, which is funny because I grew up Jewish, and I could feel my grandmother rolling over in her grave every time <laughs> I would co-facilitate a restore a small group. <laughs> but so be it. I, I found my connection where I found my connection. Um, and... I started living a life that was outward focused, focused on other people instead of me. Still had a lot of fear and insecurities, but um, now I actually am back at the newspaper doing a job um, that tells other people's stories of overcoming and redemption and transformation. And it's beautiful because it dovetails so nicely into my recovery, which I'm still active with. Um, that living for others has gone to the point where I became a foster dad two years ago and I've had one placement and I'm getting another one in the fall and uh, that doesn't still mean you know that I'm sometimes not a jerk or I say hurtful things sometimes or that I can still um, use things outside myself to make me feel better Netflix still food <laughs> sometimes attention um, though much less so um, yeah, I can definitely use things outside myself, but uh, overall, I definitely feel some peace and serenity and connection and spirit. And that would be the a little longer than three minute version. That's um, all good. That is perfect. That's, but yeah, you touched on the points I wanted to touch on. But I, I mean, if you are willing, I have, you know, yes. I'd like to hear a little. <clears throat> you know, you also had some struggles. Yes. And also have walked through those. Absolutely, and I liked, I re not liked, I loved your story because even though it was two different paths, it's identical. And mine started with joining the military, and I, that was something I wanted to do since I was a child. When I got into the military, I realized quickly that that may not have been the place for me because I was a sweet kid and I was, for the most part, nice, and that is not an environment that produces those kinds of people. So needless to say, after my tour in Afghanistan and eight years in the military, when I got out, I was an asshole. I had a huge ego. And then to feed ego on top of it, I did steroids to make myself bigger, to make myself more macho. And I felt like I had to do that because I needed people to not want to mess with me. I needed to be big and intimidating so people wouldn't want to talk to me, so they wouldn't want to mess with me. Was trauma part of your military service? Yes. I got, so I got blown up by an IED in Afghanistan, God. and um, I did suffer some head trauma, but I didn't find out about it until later on, because when I was there, I wasn't allowed to leave to go get help, because we, we were just in a bad situation, and I don't blame them or the people there or anything like that. It was my choice to go there. It was my choice to serve. I knew that there were risks, and something happened, right? So I, I did pay my penance later, 
and I had some some issues. And so well, but in addition to the physical trauma, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be in a vehicle and it suddenly blows up. I mean, yeah. it has to be some. It's crazy. It's some like, psychological and emotional trauma. The way I described it to people was like being in a head-on collision, but not being able to see the car about to hit you, because you're just sitting there minding your own business, and then it hits you so hard, and dust flies inside the truck. The truck, our truck, literally lifted off the ground, and I wasn't wearing my seatbelt, so when I flew out of my seat, I hit my head on the roof of the truck, which I'm sure is what actually caused the trauma in my head. Um, and there were other, I could go on, but there were other things that happened when I was there too that definitely made me question myself and everything that I knew to exist, it, and it changed what I felt about the military. And after that experience, um, I still had several more years to go, and it made me a really hateful, angry person. And the problem was that everybody else around me in the military was a hateful, angry person because of their own stuff. So we were just hateful, angry people to each other. Hmm. And in that process, I developed my own ego, which was to be this G.I. Joe so that nobody would want to mess with me or challenge me. And well, I felt like that would make me a good leader. I don't know if that's ego or just armor. Maybe, but both. It is both. And then when I got out, I didn't know that I had to turn it off at some point. And then when I started working at the Y, when I first came here, I saw it as an opportunity to, to learn how to talk to people again normally, not trying to be better than anybody, but just trying to talk to people. How long ago was that? That was back in 2017 is when I actually got out. And a friend okay. of mine here helped me get the job. This is recent. Uh, yeah. Wow. And I was struggling then. I, I was getting mad at people walking in the door for no reason. You know, basically what it comes down to is that I would get mad that people would talk to me or be disrespectful to me. And I'd be like, God, do you not know who I am? I'm a war veteran, you know? But of course, nobody knows that. And it's not my place to walk around telling people that either. Because it's part of service. I chose to do it to help others. It's not about me. But I was making it about me. And that's where my ego was. And then, you know, of course, the steroids and bodybuilding, that didn't help me either because that was feeding my ego, that was dumping gasoline onto it. And one day I got, I was hurt several times just from lifting weights and I had to force myself to take a break. How much weights were you lifting? Oh, I was, I was massive. I was massive. Jeez. I was a big dude. And um, I tore my pec twice. Oh my And then God. I got sciatica. And the sciatica forced me to quit working out. And when that happened, I literally asked myself, do I need to do any of this? This is this is pointless. Why am I doing it? And that is what like exploded to the, the awakening in my brain. That's what changed everything. That was your second DUI. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly, 100%. And then that's when I started questioning like, well, who am I? Like, wow. who's Cameron? You know, like, what am I doing here? And then I realized in my own way, like you said earlier, I found my own God, whatever that is. And I started figuring out that it's not always about me. And that when you start acting kind to other people, the world becomes a better place. And you can start to let go of the minor stressful things that piss you off all day long. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, the whole, so that's interesting that you found all that on your own. I needed rehab. I needed 12-step recovery, therapy. You know, I needed other people, and you did all on your own, which is super amazing. It was hard because I did try to go to therapy, and I can sum up all of those conversations that I had with therapists. This is actually while I was still in the military, with one sentence, which was, if you're not going to take the pills, quit fucking bitching about it and get out of my office. So well, I took that at face value and I said, all right, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to choose something differently. Unfortunately, it took me many years after that incident to figure it out. But it was. It was weird how one day I woke up and I said, I want something different, which was I said, I'm angry all the time mm -hmm. and I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. So then I started asking, like, well, how do I be happy? What makes me happy? And then I started figuring out that, like, everything is just a small fragment of your life and that those small things like your phone or food or going to the movies or whatever those are minor material things that bring you momentary happiness only you yourself can bring yourself full happiness uh that's amazing that you got there without other people showing you the way on that 
my, I mean, my wife, to be fair, my wife's probably listening to this and thinking, you need to say something about me. And she helped me <laughs> tremendously because... Katie wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> when I first met her, she told me um, that she didn't like how aggressive I was to other people. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to keep seeing her, so that was what really started me... Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So I you got knew, to see yourself through somebody else's eyes. Exactly. And I and it didn't matter to me. I was like, well, I want to be with her, so if that means I got to change, then that's where I started. Oh, so you and had then, a different higher power. That's right. Her, <laughs> and then working at the Y, and then my own self-awareness. Okay. Yeah. Well, still. I'm still impressed, because I needed, I needed just all these people around me in these 12 step. I needed all these people in these 12-step meetings saying, man, service is for me, not for them. Saying like I have to get, I have to stop thinking about me all the time. I mean, I had to hear that again and again and again. I had to hear it from therapists. I had to hear it from preachers, my rabbis. I mean, I had to hear it from other people in recovery um, here at the Y in those restored groups. I mean, uh, like you know, you hear something a million times. And you're like, maybe uh, they're onto something. <laughs> And then my own experience showed me like, like literally like in the morning when I do just a little bit of, you know, talking with God, higher power, whatever you want to say, like I will think of other people. Kenny Alonzo is often a former GM here at the downtown Y in Nashville. He was um, like, I don't know why I would always think about Kenny because Kenny was so kind to me. I think about my first sponsor, John B. Um, I, I think about sponsees in 12-step recovery. I think about my family, my siblings, and my nephews, um, and my Aunt Barbara and Uncle Joe. Like, I, w- I always have, like, you ever see those movies where these kids say their prayers at night when they're three or four, and they're like, and I want to, uh, God, please pray for Uncle Joey and, uh, Aunt Barbara, Barbara, and blah, 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 and... And that's, that's how I sort of start my day, is to, like, literally think of other people. Um, and that, yeah, that started leading to, like, well, what, what, like, you, like, who am I and what's my purpose? And it looks like, could be wrong on this, but it looks like our purpose is to serve each other. Yeah. And, um, and let me say it this way. When I do something for somebody else, I feel 20 times better than when they do something for me. So, even working out and the mental health thing, these things that I do, I do that so that it can be a better servant. Which sounds like pie in the sky stuff, but it's, but it's real now. Like, I just got out of the pool swimming so that my health will improve, so that I can be more present with my foster son. Yeah. So I can be more present in 12-step rooms. Now, think about this. What if everybody felt like that? What if everybody (laughs) decided tomorrow, like, you know what? I'm going to quit being so selfish. I'm going to put my ego behind me, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to make some other people happy today. That's funny you said that, because, um, so I, I had to let go of having expectations of anybody but me. Um, so in early recovery, I would judge, like, that person's not being very spiritual, Wait, that guy has 10 years sober and he's hitting on a girl with, you know, six months. You're not supposed to date for the first year. Why is he doing that anyway? He shouldn't even really be talking to her. She's in her first year. Like, judging the bejeepers out of people and that's not very spiritual. That's not... Well, you know, I've got one person I have control over. That's the other thing, the the 12-step stuff. There's only one person I have control over and that is myself. That's right. And, um... Yeah, sure. Do I think the world would be a better place if everybody was outwardly focused? <laughs> sure. But all I can control is me. That's right. But And I can still find a happiness and joy in that. I'm not saying I never get pissed off or that people don't let me down. You're human. Um, yes. And I embrace and accept that part of myself. But the other thing is, yeah, so the more self-love I have, the more I am able to love other people and accept them. But if I still hate me or I'm resentful for the way that I acted out. Like when you told me that you were Katie's husband, the f- the first thing I thought of was, well, when I knew Katie, I was drinking and drugging and was pretty out of control. I wonder if I said or did anything inappropriate around her. Right. That is the first thing I thought of. Um, 
because I was a different guy back then. And I, um, and shame uh, came over me. And uh, man, I'm, like, I get into all sorts of spiritual folks. I don't know if you've ever heard of Brene Brown. Um, but anyway, she and other, many other people, I mean, shame kills. Um, and so, you know, I just sort of forgive myself. And uh, even if there was nothing specific involving Katie, just for that behavior. Um, and when I can make amends or apologize or try to ask people how to make it right for my past behavior, I will. But overall, I still need to work on that sort of forgiving me piece of it. Because I did not like who I was before. I hear you. And, and I'm, I'm super I'm not proud of a lot of the things that I did. I'm so glad that you talked about it like that because that really is what I was getting to with that question. Like, what if everybody did that, right? Well, not everybody's going to want to do it on their own. And so it takes people who are the example, who lead by example, right? We've heard that before. Yeah. But in the sense that you're not doing it from an egotistical standpoint. You're just doing it because that's what you need to do for yourself. Right. And then by that example, other people hopefully will follow and think about it. And that's the whole point of this podcast, really. Which I love. I just want people to understand that no matter who you are, where you've come from, there's always an opportunity to fix that. There's always an opportunity to change who you are. Because yeah. There's choices. There's two choices that everyone makes every single day. Who they're going to be and who they think they're going to be. Right and wrong. Whatever that means to you, we all have some level of understanding of what right and wrong is and you make those in every moment you're awake you make a decision i can make the decision to stop this podcast right now walk out the door and leave it unfinished <laughs> but that makes no sense and that doesn't serve the other people right so those are the steps and the things that i found and i've been learning and studying in books and teachings from you know different aspects of life and those are what have helped me kind of get along through here but there were some things that I wrote down from your articles that I really love to, to read. Um, where can they find those, by the way, if they want to go read about you? <laughs> well, this is my favorite topic, me. Um, I wrote, uh, after one year sober, and I wish I would have waited a few years to write the story, but after one year sober, I did write uh, a really extensive piece for the National Scene. So, you know, Brad Schmidt, National Scene, Google will bring up a really long story about my drinking and using days and how I found recovery. Um, uh, there's also a 20 minute um, video of me speaking about recovery at the Tennessee and National Storytellers event we did a couple of years ago. So I guess those are the two biggie. I've had a couple different columns too where I talk a little bit about myself as re involves somebody else. Like I wrote when Megan Barry, our former mayor here in Nashville, lost her son while she was still a mayor, lost her son to an overdose. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote about how addicts sort of processed, recovering addicts processed that news when one of the predators, Nashville Predators NHL hockey team here in Nashville um, got suspended for uh, third, fourth, or fifth alcohol um, abuse, I wrote in terms of my recovery about um, what it looked like for me and how I understood what the, what the column was, was Dear Austin Watson was his name, um, getting fired is the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Because uh, we need, con so I was hoping that he didn't, wasn't seeing this consequence of being suspended as a bad thing. But for me, it's like, you, we all have that moment. For me, it was my second DUI and getting fired that made me go, hey, maybe I need to try something different. Um, so I'll, I'll write a little bit here and there. That's good. I'm like the token recovering addict at the Tennessee. <laughs> but it comes, yeah, I mean, it, it can be really powerful as long as I just use that voice every now and again. And I appreciate it because that, in a way, we're trying to do the same thing, which is help and serve mm -hmm. others. Yeah. And I see people walk around, work, being able to work here at the Y and living in Nashville. I see lots of people all day long. And I see people and I see them and I feel like obviously not everybody's always happy <laughs> or certainly not as happy as I am. And what I love was you talking about what it took for you to, to get to where you are and how many people and how many things it took to tell you, put your ego behind you or my lack of those outside things influencing me. Everybody has their own journey. Mm -hmm. One, if it was easy, everyone could do it easily. Two, 
Not everybody's journey is going to be identical because sometimes people are strong-willed and it takes a strong will event or person to come into your life to help you change. And three, you have to want to. Well, yes, and it's hard. So, so let me offer this to you. Um, so I've done these things, right? And at the, but at the core of all of this was trauma for me, maybe for you, but for me for sure. And there is, it is difficult and painful. It was for me, and I think for a lot of people to process their trauma. Because it is dip- Let's sit here and talk about how your mother used to punch you in the face until your nose was bleeding. Is a horrible, painful thing to walk through. Let's talk about how you felt abandoned and so alone and so in pain when your dad died. I do not want to talk about those things. I don't think... And I, sh- I was almost going to say guys. I don't think a lot of us are programmed to process... Like, Process trauma, process our pain. People don't even like to say the phrase processing pain, let alone doing it. So, yeah, I was really glad for those 12-step fellowships and, you know, that the group around me to have some people walk through, like, let me just put down this, you know, put down the drugs and put down the alcohol and put down the bad behavior and start looking at myself. Um, it is the willingness to do hard, hard work, both in 12-step recovery and in treatment and in uh, um, therapy. Like, I don't think any real, real healing happens um, until I started being willing to deal with that. And forgiving yourself. Yes. So, I mean, I remember there's something called EMDR therapy. Um It's a bunch of beepings and vibrations. And so, of course, again, in my head, I'm like, this is voodoo crap. I'm not doing it. But I was just really scared to deal with the most painful parts of my life. Um, And I remember she was able to sort of help me reprocess the way I dealt with my dad's death. And when we started talking about my mom, I threw down the little vibrating handles that you hold and took off the earphones and went, fuck it. And she was like, Okay, you're not ready. (laughs) And that's fine. And she was right. And I wasn't. But I didn't let it go. I came back to it a year or two later. Um, Yeah, that's... The the real healing for me did not start until I was willing to deal with my trauma head on. I just think that was so important in my life. That's why I'm just repeating that. the real healing cannot begin until I deal with that trauma head on. Part one is even recognizing that I was a... Because I don't want to use the word victim, right? I'm a dude. Yeah, that's you know, right. I'm not a victim. You know, most other kids' parents didn't beat them up and call them a piece of shit. They didn't. It's, and so I don't have to use the word victim... But I have to, these experiences negatively impacted my life. Uh, What would I think of an adult who treats a kid like my mom treated me? I'd be like, oh my God. That's horrible. I would call the police. You know, I, I would like, this is horrific. So I have to let myself realize that I was, if I don't want to use the word victim, fine, negatively impacted. And. I know this because it's so painful for me to think and talk about. Not as much anymore because I have processed a lot of this. So, so I, I was not able to say these things that I just said out loud without bawling like seven, eight years ago. Just lose. I couldn't even say my dad died without just choking up. Um, so anyway, that if there's one thing in my last 10 years of recovery, nine and a half years of recovery that I've really learned is I have to go for courageously to be vulnerable that vulnerability is not weakness it's strength I think that part of the problem is that we don't live in a world that is conducive to forgiveness the world will not forgive you for your things there's always going to be somebody that's going to judge you or give you a hard time I think that the first part comes 
from forgiving yourself. Let me get some pushback on that. Go ahead. Because I think the world loves a re, a, a, a return. For I sure. mean, um, I got so many good when the Tennessean rehired me. You would not believe the number of amazing positive like, yay, it's a comeback. Um, Dwight Gooden, um, I'm trying to think so there's so many sports guys who who, you know, f- fell off for whatever reasons or got involved. I don't know. I mean I didn't think like Michael Vick had you know, after a while. I I do feel like there is grace out there. But it comes first when you do it to yourself. Yeah, well, and also own your own stuff. Exactly, and that's and that's my point. Yes. You can't expect the world to forgive you. You have to start with it yourself, and when you have it, it magically starts to happen around you because everybody else can see the change in you. And yeah. I think that that's important. You know, you said you said all the right words, right? Not wanting to be a victim. And you know what? That's only because nobody wants to be a victim because we don't want other people to think about us as a victim. But what only matters is what you think of yourself. And when you get that realization first, it becomes easy to say, I'm a victim, I have problems, you know? When this, and this is an example of something that was my fault that I could have changed, but I let somebody else's perception of me influence my decision. When I got back from That's Afghanistan, right. I told my boss that I was having problems, and I was having headaches, and it was very recently after I'd gotten blown up. And he just called, he said, oh, okay, crazy boy, go go see the psych doctors, go get yourself kicked out of the military, you pussy, you, you know, whatever, insert negative term there. Yeah. And so, of course, what did I do? I chose not to go to the to the psych- psychiatric people uh, to get help because I didn't want to be thought of as weak or yeah. a victim. There's a lot right? of stigma around that for sure, yeah. And I'm so not, sorry you had that experience. It's not right. It's not, it's it's not, not right. my boss's fault because he's a victim. He's got his own problems. Mm-hmm. But I let him and how he thought of me impact me and my medical decision. Yeah. Nowadays, I know better, right? And that's ultimately what I hope people get from any of these podcasts that I'm doing is that it starts with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, the things that negatively impacted me. So that's the other thing. So I don't want to say to either, I don't want to excuse my bad behavior, sure. which was drunk driving, being rude, being... Um, taking advantage of um, people and or women or um, I mean there was there was all sorts of a lot of ego a lot of rudeness a lot of entitlement Um, uh, making jokes I'm using air quotes here making jokes by cutting people down right which was no like that's not funny (laughs) <laughs> it's it was rude. It was it was uh, squashing you down to lift me up. So I don't want to excuse my bad behavior, but I do want to say that I, for me to heal and stop help stop doing that bad behavior, um, a lot of that was coming from a place of pain. A lot of that rudeness and bad behavior was coming from a place of pain, and the only and I needed to deal with that trauma head on. So, you know, bad on me for not choosing healthy ways to deal with what happened to me, for sure. Uh, And I think we all need to acknowledge, and I needed to acknowledge for myself, bad things happened to me when I was a kid. For sure. Um, We're going to go ahead and start closing up. Is there anything you want to say to finish out? No, I love this idea, though, of of what you're doing. and of. um, um, I think, let me say this, I think the more we talk about these things the more we can take away the stigma, the less that that military commander is going to be like, yeah, oh, put the crazy label on you and call you weak uh, for wanting to seek uh, physical and mental health treatment. Yeah, I just think, I just think, um, I just applaud anybody who tells their story in a public way that uh, makes it, creates a safe space for other people to heal. Thanks, man. Brad, thanks for being on the show. And if you guys are interested in Brad's story, like he said, it's posted. You can go read about him. But he's also on Twitter, Brad Schmidt. Um, check him out. He's a real good guy, and I'd love to have him back on so that we can talk more about it. If you have any questions for Brad or for myself, you can go to our Facebook page or our Instagram and leave your comments there. But as for now, that's the closeout. And that was Hermit Radio. Thanks for listening. 